Christ to be overtaken by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. That means that it's not enough to know that the blood of Christ covers you. You've got to then tell others what, what, what has happened because the blood of Christ covers you. And that's where true overcoming strength. Let me rephrase that. I don't want to say that it's not enough that the blood of Christ covers you. What I meant to say is if you want to be an overcomer, that's only part of the equation, okay? There's also that, that part that says the word of their testimony. Tell somebody about the love of Jesus. Tell somebody what the Lord has brought you through. And that's what this series is all about. Let me read this verse and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to Brother Jeremy. And I don't know what he's got in store for you. But I'm sure he's not just going to give a testimony. Um, he's, he's going to preach because that is his testimony. Amen. He's, he, he's called to God for that purpose. Romans chapter 5 and verse, uh, verse number 8. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Before we cleaned up our act, before we got it together, some of us are still working on that. Amen. But Christ died for us. He loved us enough the love of God is committed, extended to us in that though we don't deserve it, still he loves us enough to have died and paid the price for our redemption. Amen. Isn't that good news today? That's, that's real love. That's the love we're testifying about and we're talking about in this series. And that's the love that this world needs to know about. You know, there's a lot of, I'm not preaching, I promise. But there are a lot of messed up ideas in this world today of what love is. Can I just tell you that? And, um, but the reality is, if you want to know real love, real love, real love is about a holy God that loved an undeserving people so much that he would send his only begotten son to bear their sin, to bleed and to suffer and to die and to rise again. So that we didn't have to die in our sins. But we could live in him. Amen. And that's the testimony that this world needs to hear. Your testimony is important. Jeremy come tell us about it brother. Hallelujah. I hope we didn't preach on your sermon. Okay. But uh, you'll pull it out. <laughs> come on. Make it welcome. Amen. <laughs> Turn it into a sermon. He's got nine pages of notes. Mm. Almost there. Hope y'all aren't hungry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, break this. Yeah, you're doing good. Let me get situated. Let me get situated. It all boils down to that one word, love. 
justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace and we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. <coughs> for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen. For, scarce, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure per for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love towards us, that in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. We can all do this. 
taking up because of the threat, my threat to his kingdom. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, he lost. Well, he lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God gave my mom this verse. We should not, we should not know it by heart. But it bears repeating. It's Jeremiah 29 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope in the future. This verse gets thrown around a lot. But I don't think we grasp the meaning of it. Slowly. God has to be God has a plan for you and I. It might be to work. It might be to be a parent to the next great evangelist. It might be that he's called you to be a great prayer warrior. We all have a plan for our lives. Look at Psalms 139, verse 16. Thine eyes did sing my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. I like how the Amplified puts it. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were appointed for me, when as yet there was not even there was not one of them even taking shape. My toddler years were extremely difficult on my parents. When babies were sitting up, I was not. When babies were taking their first steps, I was not. Let that sink in. It was very difficult on them. And they did not know what was wrong. I would cry for hours and hours at a time. The technology we have now was not in existence back then. So they just thought I was very colicky. Mm -hmm. When I was three years old, two years old, I was not walking. My parents knew something was amiss. And I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. The doctors told my mom to take to take me home and love me. And I'd probably be a vegetable my whole life. <laughs> and I'd have an IQ of 70. Mm. And let me just explain something. Y'all didn't really get to meet my mother-in-law when she was here in July. She's feisty. And I'm glad I was.
like an inlet. So I'm just off with that name. <laughs> And Jerry was glad that he was her son and not the doctor. <laughs> My mom told me in the doctor's office. <coughs> Jerry, look at the fan. I looked. Jerry, look at the door. And I looked. My mom scooped me up and walked out of the doctor's office. He tells us so much more nicer than his mom does. Blessed are the polite. <laughs> Sure, they'll be invited back. <laughs> <laughs> it was very difficult on my parents. I gave a promise to my mom. For I know the plans I have for him. You know, you gotta hold on to what God promised you. Even though it don't look like it. Intelligence was intact. 
However, not knowing much about thieving, they wanted to make sure I had a good start on my education. My, my mom was also taking me to a number of therapy appointments. So, but the school that I went to had therapy on site. So when I went to school, Freed up my, when I went to school, it freed up my mom to spend a little more time with my little brother. And he's just a little over two years younger than me. When I graduated from kindergarten, they wanted to mainstream me. This would have basically held me back. So my parents decided to look for another school. They looked at this very highly accredited Christian school. This is where my parents first started hitting roadblocks. The school told my parents they didn't want someone like me at their school. Y'all, that was a crazy school. My old story. That was a testimony right there, Jeremy. You didn't have to go through that. But it was a Christian school. And they said that. concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. I like that since we know with great confidence. So my parents found another Christian school that accepted me. I grew up in church. So it's just a part of our life. Yeah. 
Fast forward about a year. I was in second grade. And it, it was we were at recess. For some reason they stayed inside. This is the day that I got saved. My teacher led me to the Lord. From that point on, my life would change. However, I was not really on fire. Yes, I went to church every week. And yes, my brother and I were in a Christian school. But I was going through the motions. And I was good at it. I even fooled myself. I think that's where a lot of Christians are out there are today. They said the sinner's prayer. They go to church every week. Some of them even pay their tithes. But they are stagnant inside. Timothy warns us about this. From 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. This is why I remind you the fairness of flames, the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a Spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self discipline. Sorry. The heart what was loaded. <laughs> Fan the flames. We are not fanning the flames. Our flames will go out. I needed to find that fire I had. What came back in 1996? I I heard about this revival going on at Brownsville Assembly of God. You may have heard about that. It was in the town I lived in. My mom went one night. When I turned into two. And so on and so forth. It was one of the most incredible times in my life. I <laughs> I often laid under the floor on the under the pew on the floor. One night as Steve Hill began to give the altar call. I felt like I should go up. Being on the floor, I just rolled up since I wasn't that far. <laughs> <laughs> I 
that can be irritating. So I felt like it would be best to hire another person to help me. So I found a company. The first person they sent just stole my identity. Oh no. We were pretty close to her. And on December 31st, it's in a guy, caretaker, to my house. And as he's helping me get ready for the day, he sexually molested me. I did not know what to do. I did not know what to do. I went to my church. Told the leader what had happened. The police got involved. As well as my parents. I was devastated. Being New Year's Eve, my girlfriend had an event planned. So we went out. It took my mind off what happened. The next two weeks were a few weeks were very rough. Oh no. But my girlfriend and I My girlfriend and I were getting very close. Or that's what I thought. And two weeks before Valentine's, she told me she wanted to go take a drive to Biloxi, Mississippi. Which was about three hours away with her friends. As the night went on, I called her to check on her. No answer. Waited a while. Called her again. No answer. I was starting to get a bad feeling, but I went ahead and went to bed. The next day she called me, asked me what I wanted for lunch. I'll grab it and come to your house. We were sitting on the couch eating. I looked in her eyes. I could tell something was wrong. This is when she dropped the bombshell on me. The night before, she went out and got high. And relapsed. That's why she wasn't answering the phone. I was devastated. 
We broke up that day. I was trying to go over the molestation. And now this. And now this. That was a rough six weeks. I buried myself in my work, trying to take the pain away. I hired someone in my web design company. We became very close friends. We never dated. I thought we might. But then my company wasn't doing well. So I sold it about a year later. I felt like God was calling me into full time ministry. Her name had. Her dad was a pastor. Her dad was a pastor. So he hired me as his church administrator. That was my first job as um, my first job as church staff. I was there about six months and a lot went on. Good and bad. One night we got locked out of the church. By the church board. We had church outside anyways. We called the locksmith. I got a lot of stories. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh man, you're on the speed of that journey. <laughs> God's hand was on my life through this very difficult three years of my life. I founded my ministry, which we still operate today. At this time, I decided to go on a Christian dating website, too, as a matter of fact. I met a girl who had CP like me, and we started dating, and we actually were engaged to be married. One night, we went to go get ice cream, and the Lord spoke to me about a guy walking out. I had my aide go flag him down and begin to minister to him. He began to cry as God was healing his heart. It was an incredible moment of healing and restoration. We got back in the van, and she told me, don't you ever do that to me again. That is so embarrassing. My heart sunk. We were going to be married. However, this is how God uses me. I went home that night completely overwhelmed and questioning my life as well as ministry. In fact, my plan... In fact, my plan was resigning from all ministry the following Sunday. I was convinced that God brought me this girl to marry her. And for some reason, I didn't do that, though. Instead, I broke up with her. (laughs) I was completely devastated. Devastated to the point where I turned to alcohol to try and numb my pain. The devil began to lie to me and told me that girl was my only shot to get married. I went into an even deeper dark hole and started to do pornography. Thank God for a pastor who never gave up on me. He took me under his wing and helped me get out of this deep pit that I found myself drowning in. It was a long way up, but God completely restored my life and ministry. Now that I got all the painful stuff out of the way, let's get to what really changed my life. God, okay, you're gonna take over. God 
I graciously allowed my ministry to get restored. When God restores something, He doesn't just bring it back to where it was, He makes it better. Let's look at Job 42. Verses 10 through 17. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted, comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a, a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. Verse 12, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. She ha had also, he had also seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemim, Jemim, Jay. The name of the second, Kezia, and the name of the third, yep. That one right there. And in the whole land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old, old and full of days. God is, oh, what, that was the end of the verse. Oh, God is, the, is in the business of restoration. So I decided to try a dating website, eHarmony, and this is where I met my beautiful bride. Let me tell you something, y'all. This man on that site, I was too cheap to pay for it, so I did free. He paid for it. He waited until like the free window was over, and then he responds to me. <laughs> Wait, like, free window was like two days, okay? And like every month there was like two days. And on the weekend. So I would respond like Friday night when it started, and he would wait till Monday night <laughs> when he was preaching. Preacher didn't read it that way. Anyways, we're having trouble. Pull it back. Um, it's so neat. We found, I don't know why I do this. Um, we had tons of mutual friends, and remember when I was talking about the revival at Brownsville? Uh, Katie walked by, I walked by him. They had handicapped seating in the church. There was one area over that you can sit in. And I walked by, I walked by that area hundreds of times. I never saw Jeremy, even though we described people that we saw all the time and talked to and I sat next to. We never saw each other, um, never met. We started talking in August of 2009, but didn't go out on our first date until December because he wouldn't respond to us. Um, over New Year's Eve, I was doing a New Year's Eve service and I'd asked Katie to help me with it even though we only met two weeks prior. I had no idea, but she was planning on telling me that this wasn't gonna work out. But a few days later, we started dating officially. And I started going to church with her, and after a few months, I was on staff as a volunteer web designer. One thing led to another, and I actually worked at that church three days a week. A little over two months went by from when we started dating, and I asked her to marry, marry me. Right before our wedding, she took me to meet I took her to meet all my extended family. Um, and I took her here to good old Iowa. We stayed in Fremont, my grandma's. And it was on that trip where he fell in love with Iowa. I, and he told me that he, we were in here one day. And I was like, okay, buddy. I was opposed to it, but it was a pipe dream because of his health insurance at that time, we couldn't live out of the state of Florida or he would have no coverage. Um, <clears throat> And then Obamacare happened and made it possible because every insurance had to accept pre-existing conditions. Not only that, it shut down his insurance and he didn't even have insurance. The day we heard that, he said, okay, I'm calling the realtor. I was like, hold up a minute. I didn't really think this was going to happen. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. It's okay. 
<laughs> I was wrong. God has a plan. God has a plan. Even when we fail. Even when we fail. Even when life happens. Through our pain. Through our pain. He is working. It may feel like he has left you. I know I felt that way many times. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I have pastors sing a song. And then I'll come back to you.